Welcome back. Last week, we talked about glaciers and glacial geomorphology, the large rivers of ice that act to grind down and move mountains, and the landscapes and landforms they leave behind. This week, we'll continue the theme of breaking and grinding down rocks by talking about weathering. In this lecture, we'll introduce weathering and talk about physical or mechanical weathering, as well as the processes that are involved in physical and mechanical weathering. In the next le lecture, we'll talk about chemical and biological weathering. So weathering is the physical breakdown or disintegration and chemical change or decomposition of rocks and minerals at the Earth's surface. In geomorphology, weathering serves a few different functional aspects. Uh, for one, it is the effect of atmosphere processes on rocks and minerals. It is the adaptation of rocks and minerals to environmental conditions. And it's the preparation of rock material uh, for removal. Weathering provides a lot of the different minerals and substances that supply nutrients for plants and microorganisms. And moving further up the food chain uh, provides a lot of the nutrients that sustain higher order species, such as humans. So remember that rocks are forming underground at high temperatures and high pressures. You can think of this as being sort of protective for rocks. Um, when they're brought to the surface, the conditions at the surface are, by comparison, colder, wetter, harsher, and it forces rocks to adapt to those conditions. Um, so weathering is all of the different processes involving indirect changes in rock min minerals and the different factors that uh, influence how rocks break down include temperature and especially temperature fluctuations, uh, whether or not ice forms <clears throat> on the rock surface or within the rocks, uh, fluctuations in humidity as well as the chemical effects of different substances that are dissolved in water. So here we see the main types of weathering processes that we'll talk about over the next two lectures. Um, the first, the one that we'll talk about for the rest of this presentation, uh, is physical or mechanical weathering. And these are all of the different processes that change the state of rock, but not the composition. Um, so examples are changes in grain size or breaking apart rocks, lowering the cohesion of individual grains or minerals, um, basically making rocks smaller and smaller so that they can be more easily moved away <clears throat> or changed by other processes. In comparison, chemical weathering is changes in the composition of rock minerals. So it's the development of new compounds based on the minerals originally found in the rock and their interaction with the environment. And finally, we have biological weathering, which is really just either of those first two uh, processes, so either physical or chemical um, weathering, uh, but it's weathering that is induced or brought about by uh, biological agents. So plants, organisms, other living things. So if we think of weathering as the adaptation of rocks to environmental conditions, um, we can see this diagram here on the right showing how the former surface, this sort of ghost image that we can see here, uh, has been worn away over time as a result of the different environmental conditions. And you can see just what that surface used to look like, as well as uh, just some layers of the bedrock underneath. So weathering, remember, is just this continuous cycle of adjustment and readjustment to the different conditions found in the environment. Um, we can think of this as sort of a, a rock cycle. So rocks are formed in Earth's interior. They're brought up to the surface. They're broken down and somehow reformed. Um, either by uh, dep deposition and lithification of sediments, um, or as we've talked about in the plate tectonics lectures, 
the uh, the deconstruction of lithosphere as it subducts into the mantle. So in terms of preparing rock for removal, uh, we can think of weathering processes as sort of attacking rocks. And in this process, they produce layers of unconsolidated material that we call regolith. Now, remember that we talked about the lunar regolith, regolith in the lecture on the solar system. This is just the blanket of sediment that covers the moon, gives it the dark gray color that we can see. Geomorpholo geomorphological agents such as wind or water or ice uh, eventually will remove the regolith, again, this layer of unconsolidated material, exposing fresh rock, which can be further broken down by different weathering processes. So the most important function of weathering in a geomorphological sense is its ability to transform rocks from a solid mass to smaller pieces that can be removed and transformed. So this might be a good place to sort of just stop and uh, pause for a minute and take a little break and we will continue after that. Welcome back. So the first type of weathering that we will talk about is what's known as mechanical weathering. This is very simply put, the disintegration or breaking down of rock with no chemical alteration to the rock. So each smaller and smaller piece that we make retains the characteristics in a chemical sense of the original rock. Uh, it has a very close relationship with chemical weathering because as we break down the rock into smaller and smaller pieces, we expose more surface area, which enables chemical processes to more effectively break down the, the rock into different components. Um, so you can see what that looks like in a sort of schematic sense here. We start off with this cube of rock that has uh, sides each um, two uh, units on each side. So it's eight cubic units total. Uh, and the surface area of this cube is then 24 square units. As we break this down, so we sort of chop each of these different planes in half, we now have eight different cubic units. So we have the same exact volume of rock but we have now doubled the surface area. So we've gone from 24 square units to 48 square units. If we have each of these cubes along each of their different axes again, we end up with, again, still eight cubic units, but now we have, uh, we have more than doubled again, or sorry, we have doubled again the surface area of the rock 296 square units. So we have the exact same amount of rock as we started with, but we have a lot more surface area, which means that we have a lot more surface that chemical processes are able to, to act on. Um, the different physical processes that we're going to talk about in the rest of this lecture, uh, we have pressure or stress release, which is also called unloading. We have freeze thaw action or hydrofracturing. Uh, this is how ice uh, works to break down rocks. We also have uh, salt weathering, so how the growth of salt crystals uh, within, within small spaces within rocks helps break them down, uh, as well as insulation weathering, which is the, uh, the breaking down of rocks by changes in temperature, and wetting and drying, which is how, um, how repeated watering and then uh, evaporation of that water uh, helps to break rocks. So the first of these different processes that we'll get into is pressure, pressure release or unloading. Um, so remember that the rocks at the surface, the rocks that we see at the surface of the earth have formed at depth under enormous pressures. And they're sort of, as they're forming, they're squeezed and compressed by the weight of all of that material on top of them. Once we remove that stress, the rocks expand uh, you can think of this like if you have one of those little stress balls in your hand. 
Uh, when you squeeze it or press it into a much smaller shape, uh, it gets smaller and smaller, but as soon as you let go, it expands out. So when, when these rocks make it up to the surface, um, they are expanding, and it's that expansion that helps them to break apart. That, that expansion actually causes fractures in the rock. So that stress release, as the rocks are, able, are expanding, um, produces joints in the rock. These joints form parallel to the surface of the rock. And they are forming because the outer part, the part of the rock that is at the surface, is expanding more than the rock underneath it. Because the rock underneath it is being still being pressed down by the rock that's at the surface. So you have this increase of pressure with depth, which means that you have expansion that is uh, happening more at the surface than it is lower down in the rock. So you get these, uh, these joints forming. Remember that joints are fractures in rock that have formed with no displacement along the fracture surface. Uh, these are also called sheet joints or exfoliation fracture, fractures. But what it means is that rocks that, that break in this way form sort of sheets. So you get these, these cool uh, different layers that you can actually see where you have fractures that are propagating sort of into the, the rock surface here. You can see this nice uh, granite step feature uh, in this image down at the bottom. Um, and this is this process of removal is known as exfoliation. So we're just removing these sheets of, of rock that have formed. Uh, and this is really effective and really common in rocks that have crystal structures like, for example, the granite that we can see here. A great example of this in the real world is Half Dome in Yosemite National Park, shown in the image here. Um, this pressure release, again, produces these large exfoliation domes, like the one that we can see here. Um, and that pressure release then causes spalling, so this, these fractures. Uh, similar to like if we were to start peeling an onion, as you peel it, you get layers that are sort of smaller and smaller as we go down. And the same sort of thing happens with granites that form in this way. Um, the important aspect of this, of course, is that this opens up very large fractures in the rock. Uh, you can see great examples here again in this image. Um, and those fractures allow other processes to operate as well. So it opens it up for other physical weathering processes that we'll talk about uh, further in the lecture. It also opens it up for different chemical or biological weathering processes. So this sort of uh, stress release causing fractures uh, can have a big impact on how rocks weather. It allows all sorts of different processes to, to come into effect. The next process that we're going to talk about is called freeze thaw. So it's also called frost weathering or frost shattering or frost wedging, frost action. Uh, no matter what we're calling it, it's how ice, how freezing water uh, forces fracturing or causes fracturing in rocks. Um, so remember that one of the very unique properties of water is that it expands when it freezes. And in fact, it expands by about 9%. Um, so a block of ice has a volume that is about 9% greater than the corresponding block of water. This is why ice floats in water, um, example being icebergs or ice in your drinks. Um, and this, this ice, as it's expanding, can exert very large pressures against any space that is enclosing it. Uh, it's been measured at minus 22 degrees Celsius to be about 30,000 pounds per square inch. So this is a, th these are enormous pressures that of course are very capable of fracturing rock. So there's a problem with this very simple model of how water freezes and cracks, forms ice, expands and breaks the rock apart, and that is that these pressures are rarely reached in the real world. And they're, we very rarely see those kinds of pressures for a few different reasons. Uh, the first one is that as we increase the pressure of 
the as as we increase pressure, we are decreasing the freezing temperature of water, which makes it harder and harder to keep freezing at a constant temperature. Uh, we also have impurities in the water, so we very rarely see pure water uh, in sort of the real world. Um, those impurities also lower the freezing temperature of water, again, making it more and more difficult to to freeze at a constant temperature, because as we freeze water, uh, those impurities grow more and more concentrated, which further and further decreases the, the freezing temperature. In addition, if we have air dissolved in the water or, or, or in rock pores or in the ice matrix itself, um, we can compress that air, which absorbs some of the pressure increase that the expanding ice uh, exerts. Um, we might also have empty pores where the water can just flow into, or we can actually just have the ice or the water pushing out of the top of the crack. So ultimately, the system is usually open, and so we're not able to have the pressure increase that we, we would see in a lab setting. Um, we can form a closed system, but these conditions are somewhat unusual, and so it's unlikely that this this expansion mechanism is what is causing uh, the fracture as a result of ice formation. Fortunately, though, uh, we do have other processes that we know about that can help explain how it is that, that rocks are broken by ice. Uh, if we look in the soil world, uh, we have a process that's called frost heave. And what happens in soils is that we get ice forming at some depth, so a few centimeters, a few tens of centimeters, and this forms what's called an ice lens. We then have liquid water, usually coming via capillary action from further down in the soil. So liquid water is being drawn uh, to the ice, um, which causes that ice lens to grow or expand. And it's that expansion, that growth of the ice lens that actually jacks the soil up. Uh, you can see a really wonderful example here, uh, including some really cool uh, ice crystals forming, um, pushing out through the, through the soil. But you can see these sorts of features all over uh, permafrost landscapes and all over northern areas where, or southern areas where uh, water routinely freezes during the winter. Um, this has been observed in rocks in a laboratory setting, this sort of process where we have growth of ice lenses in small cracks and pores within, within rocks. And so that's one explanation for how this actually happens. Another example is what is known as hydrofracturing. Um, so because increasing, increasing pressure lowers the melting temperature of water, we know that water can exist in its liquid form even at low temperatures. This is a process that's known as supercooling. So even below freezing, water can still be liquid. Supercooled water can also freeze very quickly, which helps form a seal, helps increase the pressure in the small space where the water is freezing. Um, so the way that this might work is we have uh, water entering the cracks or pore spaces in a rock. Uh, it freezes from the top down. That ice then exerts a hydrostatic pressure on the water beneath it, which can force the water further in, sort of injecting it further into, uh, into the cracks or into the fractures in the rock and causing them to expand. Um, so this happens once, once we can if we can form a seal um, between the, the ice and the, and the rock uh, and keep the water sort of, uh, prevent the water from entering the pore spaces or the fractures in the rock. No matter what process we're talking about for frost weathering though, um, we need a few different things for this to happen. The first is that we need a good supply of water. We need to have uh, we need to have water that is freezing and potentially also uh, transitioning between freezing and thawing um, at several points throughout the winter or throughout the year. 
Uh, and we also need to have sustained temperatures below zero degrees Celsius so that water can freeze and so that we can continue to uh, freeze further and further into the, uh, into the rocks. Uh, these conditions, of course, are mapped fairly regularly at high latitudes, so uh, in the Arctic, in the An Antarctic, as well as at high altitudes, so in tall mountains. Um, this process, this continuous freeze-thaw or hydrofracturing uh, or frost heaving cycles produces angular blocks that are very commonly seen in Arctic areas and other high altitude mountains. And we can see an example of that here. So this is Broad Peak in the Himalaya. And if we zoom in on this sort of area just off to the edge of this nice little tributary glacier that you can see here, um, we see a one of these block fields. So we have lots of angular rocks that are collecting at the base of these uh, at, of these mountain faces as a result of having broken off uh, at different points throughout the previous years. Um, you can also in this see the fractures that are forming and the different fracture layers um, that are already existing in some of the rocks on the on the face. And again, this is these are the sorts of fractures where we get water that enters into uh, enters into those fractures and can uh, freeze and then through one of the different mechanisms that we've talked about uh, can help to expand those cracks and, and propagate them further and break the rock apart. I think this is probably another good place to, to take a break to get up and stretch your legs. So go ahead and do that and then we will continue after that. Welcome back. So the next process that we're going to talk about is what is called salt weathering. A salt is any chemical compound that contains charged atoms or molecules. It's often formed by the reaction of an acid and a base, and it yields a salt, yield, usually yields a salt and water, sometimes in solution. An example of this here, uh, we have the reaction of hydrochloric acid, HCl, as well as uh, sodium hydroxide, NaOH, and that yields sodium chloride, table salt, and water. Salts are soft, light minerals that are often sus susceptible to dissolution, which we'll talk about more in the next lecture, uh, as well as recrystallization, so where they the, the salt crystals reform after uh, water evaporates. And in fact, the salts often dissolve easily in water and then recrystallize when that water has evaporated away. Uh, different sources of salts in nature, uh, we have, uh, they're often derived from the sea, carried inland via salt sprays uh, at the shoreline. We have salts that can be carried in precipitation uh, so carried by rain and then deposited when the rain falls. And another major source of salts in the natural environment is the chemical weathering of rocks. Salts are some of the most damaging agents to rocks because of how their crystals grow and the different chemical processes that they can, uh, that they can initiate. Uh, they manifest in a process that's known as efflorescence, Commonly, a form, commonly forms uh, as this white powdery bloom that you can see, for example, um, on these bricks on a shop window. Uh, if they form below the surface, this is a process called subfluorescence or cryptoefflorescence. And when salts form beneath the surface, they cause internal stresses within the rock, which can lead to further fractures. Salts are very common in urban environments, and we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks, uh, as byproducts of atmospheric pollution. An example again here, we have the reaction of sulfur dioxide, SO2, with oxygen, O2, and water uh, to form sulfuric acid, H2SO4. This is a very powerful acid that can attack limestone, this uh, calcium carbonate, 
uh, chemical formula here, and it forms a mineral called gypsum. Uh, salt weathering typically will generate three different kinds of force, uh, or generates force in three different ways. So the first is by the growth of crystals uh, within fractures or pores within the rock. Uh, the second is with, by a hydration, so the addition of water, water molecules to the salt, and the third is by thermal expansion. So crystallization pressure is where salt crystals are forming within the pore space or within cracks in rocks. Uh, it has a very similar, or it's a very similar process to frost heave or to freeze thaw uh, that we talked about earlier, uh, because it's just the growth of a crystal structure within a confined space that exerts a large pressure and forces that, that confined space to grow with it. Um, so an example, I mentioned gypsum, on the previous slide, uh, when gypsum crystallizes, it exerts a pressure of about 334 bar, uh, which is about 5,000 pounds per square inch. So it's a fairly large pressure. Uh, when sodium chloride precipitates, or when sodium chloride uh, crystals grow, they can exert pressures of up to over 1,300 bar. If you can see an example of that here, this is from a, a study a few years ago that actually was able to measure that pressure of the salt crystals as they are growing in between grains of quartz. So this enlarges the existing fractures within the rock, breaks them apart, and enables, uh, en enables further chemical or other weathering processes to take hold. Uh, when we have salt on road surfaces, that salt can get into the cracks in the road surface that are often formed as a result of frost heave. That salt then uh, grows within those pore spaces and further disintegrates the rock, which leads to very large potholes, at least if you're living in an area where salting road surfaces is common. The next process that we'll talk about is something called hydration pressure. And this is another process by which uh, salt crystals can cause physical damage or mechanical damage to rocks. Um, this one kind of lives on the edge between physical and chemical weathering because while we are exerting physical damage, so that this is causing the, the propagation of fractures as a result of expanding uh, crystal molecules, we are also creating a new compound. So it's a little bit in between physical and chemical weathering. Um, but what happens is that we have water molecules. They attach to salt molecules or salt crystals, forming a new, new compound called a hydrate. Uh, this can cause significant volume increases uh, in the crystal structure. The example that I've uh, put up here is for a salt called magnesium sulfate. Um, when magnesium sulfate only has one water molecule attached to it, it is what is known as keyserite, and that is a monohydrate because we only have one water molecule attached to the crystal structure. When we, so magnesium sulfate can incorporate up to seven water molecules for each molecule of magnesium sulfate, so it can form up to what is called a heptahydrate, and as it expands as we add more and more molecules, uh, water molecules to this to this crystal structure, uh, we can get more and more volume increase. So the heptahydrate form of magnesium sulfate has almost double the volume of magnesium sulfate um, by itself. Uh, so in general, as we increase the amount of hydration in a salt, uh, we're increasing the amount of pressure that it can exert on the rock around it. So the more effective it is at breaking that rock structure apart. So finally, we will talk about thermal expansion. Uh, so when we're talking about salt weathering, what we're talking about is salt crystals that heat or exp that heat or expand more than the surrounding rock. So salt crystals that are forming in small cracks or pore spaces uh, heat up and expand more than the rock around it which helps to disintegrate the, the rock um, that they are 
forming within. An example is uh, sodium chloride again, uh, which has about a 1% volume expansion at 50 degrees Celsius. And that 1% volume expansion produces tensile stress in the rock where uh, sodium chloride has crystallized. As you can imagine, this is a common problem in hot environments, or not necessarily a problem, but a common process in hot environments where we have large variations uh, in temperature on a daily basis, what's called a, a diurnal cycle. I mentioned earlier uh, another of the processes that we'll talk about. Uh, this is called insulation weathering. So insulation weathering is weathering that comes about because of changes in temperature of rocks, which induces expansion and contraction. Uh, this is also known as thermal fatigue or thermoclastis, and it's influenced by the properties of the rock. The first property that we'll talk about is what's called surface albedo. So this is how much energy is reflected by the rock. Rocks with low albedo absorb more energy than rocks with high albedo, um, which means that there's more energy available for, uh, for expanding or contracting the rock as they warm and cool. Another property that becomes important is what's called the thermal conductivity. So how well rocks transmit heat or transmit energy. Uh, and then finally, we have the coefficient of thermal expansion, which is how much the material expands as a result of changes in thermal energy and in which direction it expands as well. Because if we have rocks made up of different crystal structures, those crystal structures may expand along different axes and how that is oriented within the rock has an impact on how, uh, how the rock is, is expanding. Uh, this again is a common problem in hot environments like deserts where we, have, uh, where we have lots of changes in temperature throughout the day. So very hot during the, the day, very cool at night. Finally, we will talk about wetting and drying. So wetting and drying works in a similar fashion to salt hydration. So we have moisture that gets into a rock, it's absorbed via the cracks and the pores in the rock. Uh, this could be moisture coming from um, wave action on a shoreline, this can be coming from rain or precipitation. Um, but as it, as this water uh, gets into these different cracks and pore spaces, it can produce a swelling pressure causing the cracks to expand. And then once the water evaporates away, it causes contraction. Repeated expansion and contraction, just like with, uh, just like with insulation weathering, this repeated expansion and contraction can cause flaking or cracking of the rock. And again, this is, this is a process that is important on its own, uh, but it also increases the effectiveness of other processes. So it makes more and more cracks within the rock, which enables either other, other physical weathering processes or other chemical weathering processes uh, to, to really get hold of the rock. As with the other processes that we're talking about, wetting and drying can be influenced by the properties of the rock. You know, for example, how readily the minerals that make up the rock can absorb water and expand. Um, if we have clays, for example, clays are really good at soaking up water. Uh, Montmorillonite Mont uh, is a clay mineral that expands to a thousand percent of its original volume as a result of, of water absorption. So it increases by 10 times the volume that it started with. Um, Pre-existing cracks encourage water to uh, enter uh, or give water spaces to enter and then be absorbed by the rock minerals, especially cleavage planes uh, or schistosity planes, so um, layers, um, layers in between minerals in the, in the rocks. Um, so the types of rocks that are most susceptible to this are, for example, shales, 
um, mudstones, like this example at the top of the screen here, uh, as well as uh, schists, this nice uh, sort of book layer or layered pages uh, features that you can see in this, uh, in this example here. Uh, so these different kinds of rocks, because they have so many layers within, within the rock or within the different structures, um, they're very susceptible to these wetting and drying cycles. So that is it for the lecture on weathering principles and physical or mechanical weathering. Um, have some different links here from the textbook uh, where you can go and, and learn a little bit more about each of these different processes. Uh, you're also welcome to read chapter six in the textbook Tar Tarbeck and Lutkins. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this, found this helpful, found this interesting, uh, but that's all for me. Thanks. Bye.